Welcome, friends. I'm here with Professor Judith Plaska, who's Professor Emerita of Religious Studies at Manhattan College and a Jewish feminist theologian. She's been teaching, writing, and speaking about Jewish feminism and feminist studies in religion since the early 1970s and is author or editor of several works in feminist theology. Thank you so much for taking time to talk. My pleasure. So um, what is the main way you would say that your feminist theology has evolved over the decades to this moment now? Well, um, I, my theology really began from the observation that the conversation across the centuries that has created the Jewish tradition has been a conversation among a very small group of elite men. And as I said, and standing again at Sinai, which is now 30 years old, <laughs> hard, to, uh, hard to take that in, um, women's experience has been shrouded in silence. So the question that I was raising in that book is, what might the Jewish tradition look like had women been part of the conversation from the beginning? And, and what does it mean that more and more women are entering into the Jewish conversation now? So I was trying to rethink the central categories of Jewish thought, God, Torah, and Israel from the perspective of women's experience. I, I would say that in the succeeding decades, um, my thought has evolved in a number of different ways. Um, First of all, over time, I've expanded my sense of the voices that need to be included in the Jewish conversation. Um, when I wrote Standing Again at Sinai, I wasn't out as a lesbian. And in the decade after, I wrote a number of articles on gay and lesbian issues and the need to include gay and lesbian Jews. Um, in the beginning of the 21st century, um, I asked what it would mean to challenge the gender binary in Judaism. What, what would it mean to include trans Jews? Um, I talked about race um, in Standing Again at Sinai, but I tended to see racial difference as something that was outside the Jewish community. So, you know, I talked about what does it mean to create a just society when Jewish women going to work depends on hiring women of color to take care of the children. But I was thinking of women of color as outside you know, the Jewish community. Uh, that's an issue we may want to come back to. Um, but my theology has also developed and changed, uh, not surprisingly. Um, in my chapter on God and standing again at Sinai, for example, I really focused on language about God and the destructive effects of the fact that Jewish God language is overwhelmingly male. What, what does that mean for women's self-image? What does it mean for men's self-image? What does it mean for the power structures in the Jewish community? I talked a lot about needing new images, but I didn't really talk about the concept of God. Who is God? How do I think about God? And you know, since then, my friend Carol Christ and I have written a book, Goddess and God in the World, uh, Conversations and Embodied Theology, that came out in 2016, where I really talk about the development of my understanding of God. So, and I, you know, I could talk about other theological issues too, but so, so I think, you know, those are two major ways in which my thought has evolved. And at the same time, I want to say that I don't think the issues that I raised in Standing Again at Sinai have been resolved, even in terms of equal access. So, yes, I mean, obviously, there's been enormous change in terms of leadership in the Jewish community, uh, women's ordination, and so on. Uh, but there are still salary differential step, differentials between male and female rabbis who are the heads of the large federations. There are books published every day that have, you know, 20 essays by men and two 
essays by women, even when there are many women in the field. There are panels on the Jewish future that in, don't include women or have one token woman. So I think that you know a lot of the issues that were there from the beginning remain to be addressed. And then there's the huge theological issue of the Torah. You know, the Torah <laughs> is uh, the Torah itself hasn't changed. So, so you know, how do we how do we approach? How do we talk about um, those passages in the Torah, those fundamental assumptions of the Torah that marginalize and subordinate women? Okay, good. So, th wow, that was a lot, and that, and that was really helpful. So just to pick up on this last point, how do we, and this is like a million dollar question without an easy answer, how do we, uh, um, how do we figure out what from this feminist theolog uh, theological perspective can be um, uh, preserved from the tradition? Meaning, is it basically we need to start over, um, to, you know, or can we kind of pull out that which isn't entirely tainted by a patriarchal myopic view? Um, or is it all kind of intermixed? I mean, I, I think it's intermixed. Mary Daly once commented many years ago uh, in, in uh, response, Phyllis Tribble is a, a Christian Bible scholar who done a lot of work on depatriarchalizing the Bible. And Mary Daly said, a depatriarchalized Bible would be a nice pamphlet. Um, <laughs> I personally think a depatriarchalized Bible wouldn't exist because you can't separate out the uh, patriarchal and uh, more visionary elements. They're totally intertwined. So, no, I think that we have to... I, I've never been somebody who's in favor of throwing it all out and beginning again. I mean, I wouldn't consider myself a Jewish feminist if I thought that. I, I think that we have to read the text and be honest about what's there and what isn't there and, and grapple with them and ask, you know, how we envision the Jewish community moving now and into the future. Uh, you know, you mentioned um, part of your evolution in terms of um, also on the LGBT front and also on the racial justice front. So pick up the last one and understanding, as we understand more and more, as the, as the Jews of Color movement has really been developing more and more these last few years now. How, how, do, how do you understand your thinking and your advocacy from those past decades? How might that apply to Jews of Color today? Yeah, so, so I think this is really the major challenge of our moment. I mean, obviously, particularly um, in the last two months since the murder of George Floyd, but, but long before that, that, that I think the challenge is to include Jews of color in the we of the Jewish community. Who do we mean when we say we? What's our imagined community? You know, who do we picture when we say Jews or the Jewish community? I, I grew up in an era when there were posters in the New York subway for a Levy's rye bread. You don't need to be Jewish to love Levy's. And there was a picture of a black man eating Levy's rye, picture of a Native American eating Levy, Levy's rye. And it was, it was clearly a message. If you were black, you weren't Jewish. If you were an indigenous person, you weren't Jewish. And I think that <clears throat> the Jews of color are continually confronted with the message of not belonging. You know, when they walk into a synagogue, they're assumed to be a guest or an aide, or to be there to check the coats, you know, or to clean the floors. Um, they're often asked to justify their Jewishness. It's assume they're converts. You know, when, when did you convert? Um, and, and I think there's an overlap here, though they're not the same issue with the Ashkenazi centrism of the uh, Jewish community in the U.S. because there are very ancient communities in India and the Near East whose members are perceived as people of color and treated as outsiders. Now, even though they parts of communities that are thousands of years old. So I, I think we need to begin by listening yeah. to Jews of color. 
you know, what have been their experiences? What's the diversity? There's huge diversity right. uh, in yeah. Jewish power. You know, I wonder if historically part of the experience is the opposite. You talked about um, and written about, obviously, for decades, women, women's voice being silenced throughout Jewish history. Um, and, and yet, who was standing at Sinai were Jews of color. Um, and so uh, Jews, Jews and their whiteness uh, is almost an assimilated reality of the second half of the 20th century America, um, mm -hmm. in that J white Jews can assimilate into white America in a way Jews historically couldn't really do anywhere. And so it's almost like a reclaiming to some, it's almost the opposite order from the feminist theology. Do, do you agree with that? How do you, th how do you think about that, 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 is, that history? I, I think you make a really important point. And at the same time as the dominant community in the U.S., Today, yes. white Ashkenazi Jews define ourselves in a way that, once again, marginalizes and subordinates. Yes, and you know, what, what are the synagogues that are out there and available to, for people to enter? Yes, exactly. The barriers to entry are so high. And um, and, and, and white Jews make the claim to authenticity. Um, and you're right, the, the levels of racism uh, are huge. And so I think the charge, not only to build more inclusive communities uh, and redefine who the we is, but also to demonstrate our commitment to the, the fight for racial justice as part of, as part right. of our Jewish agenda. Um, right. so, um, so just one last question for you today. Um, you know, there is so much happening right now, this tense moment, unprecedented moment with anxieties pandemic and political division and economic challenges. And I wonder what's a piece of Torah? I mean, what, what's inspiring you at this moment or guiding you, if not inspiring, guiding you to make sense of this, of this moment? Well, my, my favorite Torah text is be kind to the stranger for you as strangers in the land of Egypt. I mean, that's, that's sort of my baseline yeah. text. And I see that as posing a central challenge to the world. You know, can we use our experiences of outsiderness, and everybody has them, to identify with other outsiders? You know, how do we hold on to the memory and the experience of being an outsider when we are no longer yeah. outsiders? But, but I also have to say that the process of studying Torah is more powerful to me than any particular passage. So it isn't necessarily only the text I like that I find useful. Yes. Now it's also Torah holds up a mirror to the world. Uh, so it's often the most horrible things in the Torah that teach us the most about the world that we live in. So I think that we can use difficult texts as starting points for talking about the difficult reality we're living in. Right. Yeah. Very well said. Very well said. And, and, um, and the fact that once we are engaged in textual study, we can see that what seems totally abnormal in this moment in some ways is just uh, relatively normal throughout history. A yes. history of pandemics, a history of war, a history of corruption and lies, a history of oppression and marginalization. That is disturbing, but it can also comfort us in that we've navigated this before, <laughs> poorly and well. And we can use it as a starting point for confronting our reality and asking how we move forward. Beautiful, beautiful. Friends, uh, be, be sure to check out um, the writings and teachings of Professor Plaskow. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you.